So we're continuing our discussion of topic four, the Muslim community or the Ummah. And we have looked at the fact that the Ummah uh, traces its spiritual origins back to Abraham and as well is connected with uh, the faith of Israel and the church. It, it sees itself as a continuation and completion of those faith movements. And we talked about how that Islam believes that Adam is the first Muslim prophet and uh, Muhammad and Abraham the middle and Muhammad the final Muslim prophet. Now some of you are saying, well, what does this name Islam actually mean that you keep talking about? Um, Islam uh, comes from the, from the, from the uh, term salam, which means peace, peace. So Islam means peace. What kind of peace? It is the peace that comes from submission to the will of God. That's how Muslims understand Islam to be. Peace that comes from submission to the will of God. The term is derived from the term salam, meaning peace. In the Hebrew, we say shalom, shalom. It's derived from that term, shalom, salam, Islam, that which brings peace. And what brings peace? Submission to the will of God. So the word Islam, as Muslims understand it, is the peace that comes from submission to the will of God, Islam. Um, and, and, and Muslim, the term Muslim, means one who believes in Islam. The person who believes in Islam is referred to as a Muslim. And so when Muslims say that you are naturally Muslim, what they mean is that your natural inclination is to believe in God, to be a believer, you see. And if you believe in God, then certainly you will want to believe in his will and his revelation, which is Islam. And Islam, as we said earlier, is instruction on what you should do and what you should believe. Now, in the Christian movement, we refer to redemption. We need redemption. Muslims say we don't need redemption. We need instruction. And Islam is that instruction, you see. When I wrote this book with Badru Katarega, I wanted to write one chapter on salvation. He refused to write a chapter on salvation. He wrote a chapter on Islam. Uh, the peace that comes from submitting to God's instruction. That's what he wrote. I wrote a chapter in salvation. He said, I don't believe in salvation. I don't need salvation. I need instruction, you see. Within Islam, the world is a schoolhouse in which you have a teacher who teaches you right instruction. And the instruction is Islam, you see. And the teacher, of course, are the imams or the prophets who provide the instruction. And so what we need is instruction. Islam is the curriculum, which is taught in the schoolhouse. And the prophets bring that instruction and the imams explain it in the, in the mosques. Within the Christian movement, yes, we need instruction to be sure, but most significantly, we need redemption. We need a savior, you see. And that's what Jesus is all about, the gift of salvation, a savior, a redeemer, a good shepherd who goes and finds the lost. That's the Christian theology, the Christian faith. So we'll be talking more about that. But very, very good questions. Yeah. So Muslim is the one who believes, and Islam is the faith. And the faith is instruction, what you should do, what you should believe. As you submit to that instruction, Muslims say you then have, you then have peace. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now we continue looking at this theme here, uh, the Muslim community. Um, and we're looking at point five here in this, uh, in this overall theme. And this is that, um, um, and we were talking about that at the last time as we brought that to conclusion, where Muhammad is seen as the final prophet um, uh, in contrast to Abraham, who is the middle prophet, and Adam, who is the first prophet. This final prophet is an Arabian prophet, and he proclaims an Arabic Quran. Now this is amazing, according to Muslims that the Arabian people, who are considered so backwards, you know, they are so ignorant that God 
takes them, when you compare them with the other nations surrounding, surrounding them, like Syria and Egypt and so forth, and God takes this, this people and exalts them so wonderfully that the final word of Revelation is an Arabic Quran, and the final prophet is an Arabian prophet. It reminds one of the Magnificat in the New Testament, where Mary is so amazed that God would take her and exalt her to be the one through whom the Savior would come, you see. And that God takes this prophet, this orphan boy, this poor, poor orphan boy, this little Arabian orphan boy, you know, that the whole world ignores and passes by, and God exalts him to be the final prophet um, and, and proclaim the final word of revelation, which is an Arabic Quran, a revelation meant as a blessing to all people. And that's Islamic vision. And so this revelation brings about the formation of the Ummah, the Muslim community. And this community is the perfect community. <laughs> this community is a perfectly balanced community. It does not go from one extreme or the other extreme. Some of my Muslim friends have told me, I think with a chuckle, um, I don't know how serious they are about this, but they'll say, take for example, David, you're Christians. Um, you cannot get divorced. We Muslims can get divorced when necessary. You know, Christianity is too conservative, too narrow, too unachievable. Islam is fully achievable. In a marriage, sometimes things go wrong, you have to get divorced. Islam recognizes that. Or for example, and here's where they say it with a chuckle, I think, uh, as Christians, you can have only one wife. That's too conservative. Within Islam, four wives. That's perfectly balanced. Not more, not less, four just exactly right, you see. If you have more than that, that's excessive. So Islam is the balanced community not excessive on one side or the other. Um, um, and it is a community that will never go astray. It will never miss the way. I say this very gently, but, um, um, you know, in our churches, when we gather together for worship, uh, I hope that our pastoral prayers include prayers of forgiveness and confession. And our personal prayers, that our personal prayers include prayers of confession and forgiveness. Uh, that is not typical in the Muslim gatherings for prayer, prayers of confession, because the Muslim community is the perfect community, you see. God would never let it go astray. So why would you need to confess the sins of the Ummah when it is the community, which is the perfect community. And I think the difference, of course, is that within the church, grace and forgiveness, the grace of God in Jesus Christ, for us sinners, is celebrated uh, Sunday after Sunday as we gather together. And so we thank God for that gift of his grace, his forgiveness. It's a it's, it, it means that our worship services are times of celebration because of God's grace revealed to us. We're not a perfect community. My church is not perfect. Yours is not perfect. We're all broken. All of us broken communities. But we're communities touched by God's grace. And it's called to be a witness over the nations. The Ummah. Which is formed by this proclamation of Islam as revealed in the Quran. Let me pause for comment or question. Then I'll, then I'll have a wrap-up comment as we come to the conclusion of this session. Yes. Muslims believe that Ummah is a perfect community. That's right. But as far as I know, there are so many different movements, uh, so di different uh, leadership groups, and they really have big tension between each other in Islam. Yeah. Yeah. How do they explain it? Yeah, very good question. I also asked my Muslim friends, could you please show me one example of this perfect community? Just one. They always blame it on outside forces, in my experience. It's the West, it's Russia, whatever you know. It keeps messing things up. Yeah. Then what, what do they understand about the sin, shirk? I know that uh, 
Catholic Church and there were several other con- uh, denominations believe that sin is a violation of God's law. Yes. Orthodox Church says, well, it's not <coughs> only a violation of the God's law, it's also spiritual sickness which needs to be healed. How, how, how do they understand what sin is? Sin is making mistakes. We are naturally good, but as naturally good people, we do sometimes make a mistake. And so sins are mistakes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on when we look at, uh, at uh, Christian and Muslim anthropology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but a very, very good question. Yeah, yeah. We're having these dialogues with the Iranian Shiites in, in Iran, and uh, I think the next dialogue is going to be on anthropology, who we are as humans, and this will be a core issue. Yeah, yeah. But what, what is the nature of sin? Mm-hmm. Very, very, very good, very good question. Yeah. And this Ummah, notice, it is called to be a witness over the nations, over the nations, which does suggest uh, witness from a position of, of power. Um, I think this is one reason that our Muslim friends so often are so committed to political action, because um, if they're to be witness over the nations, they really need positions of power to effectuate that, if possible. So, um, like in the United Kingdom, there's just a lot of discussion now with the Muslim community about the role of Sharia law, all that kind of thing. It has to do with this conviction that the community really should bear witness from a position of, um, of authority. You know. um, now we'll look at point seven as we wrap this up. So Muslims and Christians and Jews are committed to worshiping the God of Abraham. Muslims refer to God as, um, I'm sorry, Abraham or the, or the Jewish people as Elohim or as you said, um, Eloha, um, God Almighty. And our Muslim friends, God is Allah, which is um, a synonym with the, the uh, Hebrew name for God. And uh, another name for God is um, God is I am. Now that understanding, uh, or Yahweh, that understanding of God uh, has passed uh, the Muslim community by. It's, it's not an understanding which one finds present within Islamic theology. I think we could turn for a moment to, um, to uh, Exodus chapter 6 with a very, very interesting verse here <clears throat> where we read verse 2. Now this, this, is, is, this is in the context of God coming down to meet Moses at the burning bush. And God says, uh, I have come down to redeem my people from, their, from, their, from slavery. I've come down. And so um, uh, then God goes on to explain, verse 2 of chapter 6, God said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. So what does this mean? This, the Lord, is God as Yahweh. God is Yahweh. So to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I revealed myself as Elohim, or Eloha. You see, that's how I, how I reveal, reveal myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as God Almighty. That's true. God the Creator is God Almighty. Absolutely true. But now to Moses, I, inter- I reveal myself as the Lord, Yahweh. What does this mean? This is the I Am. What does God as I Am do? Well, a Muslim theologian told me one time, one thing it means is that God as I Am cannot be named. You can't trap him in the name Allah or Eloha. <laughs> no name can capture God. The Muslim theologian was exactly right. You can't put God in a box of a name. He is bigger than any name that can contain him, you see. But it means beyond that, that he is the God nevertheless who comes down and meets us in order to save us. That's what he says. I am God who has come down to save you in these earlier passages here in Exodus. This name for the God who comes down to save, this unnameable God, is I am. I am what? I am the God who comes down. I am the God who meets you in personal encounter. Theologians refer to this as I, thou, encounter. The God who meets us, you see. Um, and, uh, And that understanding of God 
as the God who comes down and meets us in order to save us and redeem us is an understanding of God that I have not found in the Quran or in Islamic theology. Um, it's God Almighty, absolutely, you see. Um, and we all agree with that. But here, biblical theology it moves us beyond only God Almighty, who in his compassion sends his will down to us, moves us beyond that to the God who comes down and meets us. So when I attempt to interpret to my Muslim friends Jesus as God with us, I begin right here with the burning bush. God came down and met Moses at the burning bush as the I am, as the Savior God who comes right into the midst of our tragic history to redeem us and save us. He comes down and meets us. And he meets us in I thou encounter. He met Moses at the burning bush. They dialogued. They, they discussed. They, they argued. You know, I thou encounter. And then I say, so he came down in the burning bush. And then, many centuries later, he has come down in Jesus the Messiah. He came down in the burning bush. And now in Jesus, he has come down in the person, you see. Why has he come down? To save us and to meet us, that we might know him. I, thou encounter. And then I like to say, and one day, many years ago, he came down and met David Shank. Not in a burning bush, no, but he met me. And so I know God. And he redeemed me. I know I'm a redeemed child of his. For he came down and met me, and he has redeemed me. I know that's true, you see. So what happened at the burning bush is not a strange notion to me. Because I meet God not only back there when I first met him, but day by day God meets me. He is, God is Yahweh, the one who comes down and meets me and saves me day by day. Yes, question. Come so the Muhammad never met God. He met Gabriel. That's right. So he met angels. That's right. Does anyone work for Muslim, the idea, can a man meet God? Is anybody was there, there, there is a hint. There, there is a hint of this in the Quran in terms of Abraham. Abraham is referred to as the one whom, who is the friend of God. So how can you be a friend of someone that you never really meet? And there's where the Sufi theology, the mystical theology in Islam comes in. And they make a lot of that, a friend of God. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about Sufism. Yeah, yes. So basically, I mean, is that Abraham become bigger than Muhammad? Because Muhammad only talked with the angel, while Abraham and Moses talked with the God. Do they accept? Well, they, they will say that they will say that every prophet had his gift to offer. You see, uh, Moses is referred to the one who had the word of God, the kalam, the word of God, and Abraham as the friend of God, Muhammad as the seal of the prophets, Jesus as the miracle worker. You see, and as the Messiah. And as the word of God also, Jesus, the word of God, Klimatula. And so they'll say each prophet has their distinctive gift that they offer. Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. But they accept that, that Abraham and Moses talked to God while Muhammad talked to angel. No, no, they would never say Muhammad talked to God. No, no. But they agree that it's Abraham. Gabriel, it's Gabriel. Mm -hmm. But they agree that Moses and Abraham talked to God and met God, kind of encounter. Um, ask, ask Muslims about that. I'll just say that there is intrigue within Islamic theology about Abraham being the friend of God. And the Sufis say that means we can know God. Strict Orthodox Islam says, wait a minute, that's pushing it a bit far, you see. But that verse is a point of theological dialogue with Muslims. And of course, it's a point of dialogue with Christians and Muslims as well. Yes, Abraham was a friend of God. You know, with utmost humility, I share with you, I'm also a friend of God. What? Yes, 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 yes. In Jesus, I'm invited into God's family. I become his friend. Yeah. We bear witness that, that that's true. That's true. And all the Sufis, they love that. Because that's what they're looking for, the Sufis. See, we'll talk more about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my, you are very insightful theologians here. And so both Jews and Christians and Muslims all believe that God is known through revelation. Muslims and Jews and Christians believe that creation is a dimension of revelation. Oh, Muslims are very impressed with the role of creation in revelation. All of creation is an ayat, an ayat, a sign of God. Ayat means sign.
And there's many Quranic verses that, that contemplate on the wonders of creation, these signs of God everywhere. This is a dimension of revelation. But Muslims, Christians, and Jews also believe that revelation is not adequate revelation, that creation is not adequate revelation. We also need scripture. And so all three of these movements are movements based upon scripture. The Jews believe that the Torah is the soul of scripture. And then you have the writings and the and the poetry and all that built around it. But the very heart of it is the Torah, the revealed law of God through Moses, the Torah. And Christians believe that the living word that became flesh, the word became flesh and lived among us, is the very soul of God's revelation. And Muslims believe that the Quran is the final revelation. So these three communities that are committed to embracing revelation have different centers of revelation. And those centers deeply form our understandings of God. And so each of these Abrahamic faiths are formed by these different centers. For Judaism, the Torah. For Muslims, the Quran. And for Christians, the living word. The living word. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Let me conclude. Um, I was uh, invited um, um, just a little over a year ago to Yale University in the United States for a uh, two-day dialogue with Muslim theologians. There was 80 Muslims and 80 Christian theologians coming from all over the world. And uh, the particular presentation I was invited to make had to do with uh, speech and love, speech and love, a 10-minute presentation. What I did was to go to John chapter 1, where the word becomes human and lives among us. And I said, both Jews and Muslims believe that we know God through revelation. With Muslims, the word has become a book. Within the Christian movement, why the word has become human and lives among us. And so this word, who is Jesus the Messiah, reveals that God is love. The speech of God reveals that God is love. God is loved, loved so greatly, in fact, that the word suffers for us suffers for us on the cross, you see. That's how great God loves. So it's not just that he instructs us with his word, but he comes into our experience fully participating in our suffering, our agony, our sinfulness, and on the cross, with all the hate and rebellion of the world crashing into him, he forgives. But that's what the word reveals. That's what the gospel is. That's at the heart of the gospel. That's what I shared with this group of Muslim and Christian theologians. And afterwards, a couple of the Muslims came to me and said, thank you. We have now understood the gospel. <laughs> thank you. In fact, one of them from Mecca said, I want you to come to Mecca sometime and share this with the, with, with the Muslim leaders in Mecca. I said, I don't think that'd be possible. He said, I think I could work it out. But it hasn't worked out yet. But I'm just saying, the gospel is very, very good news. And we're called to bear witness with humility, but with great joy that the Word has become human and lived among us. The Word participates in our suffering. In our, he, he experiences our sinfulness to the full. And on the cross, with his arms outstretched, he forgives. That's the heart of the Christian faith. That's the gospel, which is at the very soul of the faith that we proclaim. And it's that gospel which forms the church and our sense of mission in the world in which we live. Thank you. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion 
and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota. 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.